Right guys, welcome to this research methods video on controlling variables. This is lesson two in research methods, and so if you haven't watched lesson one yet, I would recommend that you do that. It's linked at the top of your screen now, simply because you need to have some understanding of things like IVs, DVs, and the idea of cause and effect to fully make sense of this lesson. Now, if you remember from lesson one, the key to an experiment is that an IV is manipulated to see how it affects the DV. The only thing that should influence the DV is the IV. Okay, now if there are any other variables that might potentially interfere with or obscure the relationship between those two variables, those need to be taken into account. They need to be controlled, minimized, or even removed entirely so that the validity of the results remains intact. Now, in this video, we're gonna be exploring some crucial concepts in designing experiments that play a key role in determining the validity of psychological research. And you can see those concepts on the screen now. They are very important in both year one and year two of the course. They come up regularly in exams and they also are very common in evaluation points that are based on poor methodology. Okay, now just to be clear, the first four items in that list are problems that the researcher needs to be aware of and the last three are ways of dealing with those problems. Okay, and we'll go through each of them over the course of the next 10 minutes or so. OK, and hopefully by the end of the video, you'll understand what all of those terms mean and how they impact the research and why controlling them is essential for producing reliable and valid results. So first up are extraneous variables. Now, these are any variables other than the IV that could potentially affect the dependent variable. If they're not controlled, they can introduce noise into the data, which makes it harder to determine whether the changes in the DV are truly caused by the IV. So let's look at an example. Imagine you're conducting an experiment to test the effect of sleep on memory. The independent variable is the amount of sleep that a participant gets, and the dependent variable is their performance on a memory test. Now, factors like lighting in the room, the time of day, the ambient noise, or even the participant's motivation on the day could affect memory performance. Okay, and they're all examples of extraneous variables. Now, importantly, extraneous variables do not vary systematically with the IV. And that means that they're not dependent on the IV. They're not linked to the IV in any meaningful way. OK, extraneous variables also don't necessarily affect all of the participants equally. Some of them might be affected by ambient noise. Some of them might not. Some might be affected by bad lighting, but some of them might not. OK, but if extraneous variables are not controlled, they could potentially obscure the relationship between the IV and the DV and reduce the validity of the results. Now, next we have confounding variables. Now, a confounding variable is a very specific type of extraneous variable that influences both the independent variable and the dependent variable in a way that makes it unclear which one is causing the effect on the DV. Now, unlike extraneous variables, confounding variables do vary systematically with the IV, which means that they are directly linked to the independent variable and that makes confounding variables different in every experiment because they always depend on what it is you're actually studying. So let's put it into an example. Imagine researchers are studying the impact of exercise on mood. A confounding variable in that research might be participants' diet. Diet could influence both how much exercise somebody engages in and their mood making it unclear whether exercise or diet is responsible for the changes in mood. OK. OK, moving on, let's have a little look at demand characteristics. Now, demand characteristics are 
cues in the experimental environment that might reveal the purpose of the study to the participants. OK, and if the participants work out what the researcher is studying or what the study is about, then they might change their behavior to fit what they think the researcher wants to see. OK, that means that they might deliberately underperform in the research in order to sabotage the study, or they might act in a way that helps the experimenter because they want to be helpful and they want to make sure the experimenter gets what they need from the study. For example, if participants in a study on generosity realize that the aim of the experiment is to observe their helping behavior, they might act more generously than they would normally do just to please the researcher or because they think it's the right thing to do. Okay, they obviously might go the other way as well, and they might act less generously than they would normally do just to sabotage the research. But either way, they're doing something that they wouldn't normally do. And that means that participants are acting unnaturally during the experiment, which ultimately compromises the validity of the study because the participants' actions no longer reflect their true responses as they would be in the real world. OK, and our final problem that you might come across in research is investigator effects. Now, investigator effects happen when the researcher unintentionally influences the outcome of the study, often by interacting with participants in ways that affect their behavior, but also through actions related to the design of the study, such as participant selection. As with the other factors that we have discussed in this video, Investigator effects introduce bias and can obscure the role of the IV on the DV. So, for example, if a researcher subtly nods or smiles when a participant answers in a particular way, it could signal to the participant that they're giving the right response. And that could then influence the results by encouraging certain types of responses. OK. So. Those were all the factors that could potentially introduce problems into research. We're now going to have a look at ways of dealing with those problems. So our first way of dealing with unwanted variables is randomization. Now, randomization is the use of chance to reduce any unconscious bias that the researcher might have when designing an investigation. So, for example, if participants are going to be asked to learn a list of words, the order of those words should be randomized so that it's not determined by the researcher. Or if participants are taking part in multiple conditions within the research, then the order in which they experience those conditions should be randomized. OK, the idea is that adding an element of chance means that you are reducing any possible investigator bias. You might not necessarily get rid of it completely, but you're definitely going to minimize it. A second way of dealing with unwanted variables is standardization. Now, standardization means keeping the procedure exactly the same for all participants, with the exception of the manipulation of the IV. By standardizing procedures, researchers can ensure that extraneous variables are controlled and the results are more reliable and valid. For example, in a study on memory, if one group is tested in a quiet room and another group in a noisy room, that could affect the results. But if both groups are tested in the same room under the same conditions, we can be more confident that any differences in memory performance are due to the manipulation of the IV. OK, so in this case, the location of the research has been standardized, that part of the procedure. OK, and finally, our last two ways of dealing with unwanted variables are single and double blinds. OK, now a single blind procedure is when the participant in a study is unaware of the details of the experiment, for example, the aim or the condition that they've been allocated to. And this is done in an attempt to control for demand characteristics, because the less participants know, the less likely they are to work out what the study might be about and change their behavior to match the expectation. 
A double blind procedure takes that a little bit further in that neither the participant nor the researcher who conducts the study are aware of the aims of the investigation. Okay, so in this case, the hope is that both demand characteristics and investigator effects can be controlled or minimized. Okay, and that brings us to the end of the content. There's been a lot of new concepts over the last 10 minutes or so, and so I've just put them all back on the screen for you to have another look. Like I said earlier, these come up a lot in exams and in evaluation points, and so knowing what they are, but also knowing how they impact the research is really important. So just make sure you spend a little bit of time going over it all, and then grab a past paper and see if you can find some questions that are relevant to these concepts. Paper twos are always a great place to start for research methods because they've got an entire section of research methods that you can get stuck into. Okay, I hope it's all made sense. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I will get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.